Welcome to The Bleeding Effect, a podcast where we venture back through time to relive Assassin's Creed history. Lean back into the animus and join us. We are your hosts, Jarrett and Tiffany. And this is our second episode you're listening to. It's titled Not Quite Permitted. In this episode, we will introduce you to the very first game and its characters. So up front here is our um, non-spoiler policy we have. So since we're covering the games chronologically uh, by release, we don't want to talk about any of the games that come later on in the series. So um, please don't tweet or post about games uh, that are to come in the future. Or, I mean, games that have, are released that aren't talking about one. Right now we're talking about one. <laughs> so... Do you want to talk about the recap, what we did last episode? Yes. So in the previous episode, we introduced you to the history of the creation of the game, the team that came over from Prince of Persia to start on the first ever Assassin's Creed game. Uh, we also talked a lot about the real history behind the Third Crusades. I know you got bogged down with a lot of information, but I promise it'll make a lot more sense once we get into the rest of the story of the Third Crusade. So in this episode, we're going to be covering the very start of the game, and hopefully get to our first three targets. Okay. So, in the beginning of the game, um, you start to see uh, a lot of fuzzy glitches that are happening, um, and there's a long quote by um, by a character whose voice is off screen. Uh, I applied my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I perceived this was also but chasing of the wind. Wisdom is but grief that in... And he that increaseth knowledge, increaseth sorrow. So this is a biblical quote from Ecclesiastes one eighteen, or a variation on it. And it's unknown why they start off with that, but that's what happens in the opening sequence as um, uh, the main character is getting adjusted to being inside of the animus. Since he's not adjusted, um, the glitches start happening and you start to see like images flash on screen as he starts racing throughout the streets and everything. So uh, one of the doctor's voices is a female voice and she's talking about there's a problem and she's uh, he's retreating um, as you see the hazy memory. Um, um, there's too much psychological trauma, and then they say um, she's arguing with the male doctor who's saying that you just need to relax and uh, try to let this memory play out, and since it doesn't work, they pull him out. Uh, and we're introduced to our main character, Desmond. So he awakes from the animus and then curses the doctor for kidnapping him and forcing him into the memory simulation. Um, the male doctor that we're introduced to is a doctor named Warren Vidic. He's um, a leading Templar. He's a member of the Inner Sanctum in Abstergo, which company we'll um, get into later, what their affiliations and their purposes are. Um, but right now, he's to tell him about um, why they've kidnapped him. He asks why they've kidnapped him, and they says that he needs what he has, that he is an assassin, and he knows something they need. And Desmond says, uh, why do you think I know something? You know, I'm just a simple bartender. As he says, uh, I can show you how to mix the martinis. So uh, he says, uh, yeah, uh, no, we know that you're an assassin. Vidic says, we know you're an assassin, so um, stop playing games. And he's like, well, I'm not an assassin, not anymore. So he thereby admits that he was an assassin. Which we'll get more and we'll get more of that covered later. Um, so he gives him the choice. He says he can either comply with their demands. Oh, he also says that he um, he read something on his file about an escape, which is fortunate for them. So that will also be that's more that's going to be elaborated on later. Um, he said Vidic gives him the choice that he can either comply with their demands and. Um, go through with the uh, memory regression or he can um, fight them and they'll induce a coma and uh, retrieve what knowledge they need from him anyways. And the only reason why he's still conscious is because this method saves them time. From this we learned that, um, well, we learned that they sought him out for his affiliation with the assassins and that this 
animus method works best on complicit subjects, not on unwilling ones. So, um, the animus, by definition, uh, Vidic introduces us to our first definition, which is a projector that renders genetic memories in three dimensions. So the important thing to know about Assassin's Creed is um, how the animus works and how it deals with genetic memory. So according to the history of Assassin's Creed, um, a genetic memory, or first he introduces us to memory, which is a recollection of a past event. And according to him, a genetic memory is something that animals use that's um, commonly called instinct. It's how they learn to hibernate, uh, reproduce, and migrate. Um, they're automatically born with the knowledge, with the pre-existing knowledge of that. And uh, in humans, this includes like um, the memory of past events that happened to them. So these are housed in our DNA, and they can be unlocked using this device, the Animus. It uh, pinpoints certain genetic code, and they can find it. But the problem is that the specific memory they want to target in Desmond is being blocked by his subconscious, and in order to get him to where they need to be, they need to ease him into the program. Uh, for instance, he needs to go through the training simulation with how to be an assassin or certain behaviors that coincide with his um, character. Now, there's a term that's not brought up um, that I didn't find brought up yet, but it will come up from the Animus. Through the training tutorial program, the Animus talks a lot about synchronization. And um, later on in the series, there's lots of mentions of getting 100% synchronization. So synchronization means how effectively and how thoroughly you walk in your ancestors' footsteps. Doing things outside of your ancestors' um, common behavior um, lead to desynchronization. Getting killed gets you desynchronized. Acting out of character, such as since you're an assassin, like if your ancestor didn't break the creed at the time, then you'll be desynchronized because you're doing things out of character. So the animus will warn you um, this path or th these actions will lead to immediate desynchronization if you're getting close, like if you're walking out of bounds of what their memory was or if you're doing something completely out of character. So that's the gist of genetic memory. Now we're going into, um, and the tutorials that he covers in the game one thing I do need to mention is that um, an experience, because the, game, the gameplay tutorials really just um, like the maneuver mechanics and how an assassin blends in and what he uses. But one of the key things about the series is something called Eagle Vision, which you'll see in every single game. It's a staple, it's a heavy staple of the game series. Eagle Vision is where, um, right now they explain it as how uh, the assassins and how Desmond's ancestors, well, how Desmond's ancestors particularly saw the intentions of their um, of their targets and others around them. So they'll glow different colors when you're in eagle vision mode, depending on what their affiliation is. Your targets grow, glow yellow. Your enemies glow red. Um, you have like points of interest are all lit up in white, and blue people are all of your allies. So that's how you know who's an enemy, who's not, supposedly. So we'll get into right into the game. Uh, the opening scene, Sol uh, Temple of Solomon. Uh, we're introduced to three characters. Our main character of the game uh, uh, is Altair ibn Laahad. And Altair is an Arabic word meaning eagle. Um, he's a master assassin. Also, the name Eagle or uh, different, lab different um, translations of Eagle is going, <laughs> is going to be the um, the common name for every assassin played throughout the series, as we'll come to find out. So, he's a master assassin, and that's pretty much all that's known of him at this point. Um, 
and the other characters are um, Malik and Kadar, uh, two uh, lower level assassins who are um, not Malik was um, secretly charged by the master Al Mualim to uh, monitor Altair, and Kadar, being his younger brother, is allowed to tag along for this important mission. So they go into the Temple of Solomon, and the first thing that happens on scene is Altair breaks the first tenet of the creed. Uh, as Malik shouts out that a certain man doesn't have to die, um, Altair comes on screen in true assassin style and just stabs him through the throat, stabs the old man through the throat, and uh, Malik questions his uh, decisions on why he decides to break the creed and everything. Um, he brings up the fact that part of the assassin slogan is nothing is true and everything is permitted, which is the entire assassin slogan. But this is interesting because um, come to find out that's not quite permitted as it doesn't go with the creed. Mm. So, and his next, um, his next statement is um, really that his way is better um, than following the creed, so uh, Malik tells him to try not to dishonor their uh, their brotherhood further, and uh, Kadar asks um, for Kadar just praises Altair's skill and and his kills and everything, and is just wants to be just like him and everything instead of like his older brother Malik, Malik. So he asks what the mission is, and he elaborates on the mission that it is to find and retrieve the Ark of the Covenant. We next come into the room. Uh, in Solomon's Temple of the Ark of the Covenant, and they all notice it. And as this is noticed, also uh, below them uh, enters the room uh, Robert de Saab and his uh, group of Templar men. So Tiffany's going to elaborate on R Robert de Saab. All right, so in the last episode, we didn't have a chance to get to Robert de Saab, but he is, in real life, the 11th Grand Master of the Knights Templar. He was in charge from 1191 to 1192. He was also the Lord of Cyprus from that period of time. Cyprus is a small island off the coast of the Middle East in this region, and it was actually controlled by the Crusaders. It was one of their main supply chains for the war. Um, De Salle worked closely with King Richard and even captured many towns along the seacoast of modern-day Israel, and he successfully took back the city of Acre from the Saracens and fought closely with Garnier de Nobilis, who we'll also get to later, in the Battle of Arsuf. Uh, so De Sop's kind of special. He was a Templar for less than a year when he was made Grand Master of the Temple Order in 1191. In fact, when the previous leader died, De Sop wasn't even a member of the Knights Templar. Uh, uh, the delayed elections brought on from the war, from the previous person's death, allowed enough time for De Sop to be able to join up and gain enough recognition to be considered a great candidate for the new leader. Uh, Dasab purchased the island of Cyprus from King Richard to establish a base of operations, like the Hospitaliers did with Malta, but after two years decided to sell it off to Guy de Lison, king of Jerusalem at the time. Dasab does die in 1193 in the Holy Land, though not via assassination, if that's what's planned for him in the future. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to mention... These events that are happening right now, they all take place in the year 1191. <coughs> that is the setting for, that is the, the historical yeah. setting for the game. Um, the modern day setting for this is, um, as we'll later find out, is in September of 2012. So okay. Desmond is in the lab in September of 2012. So but where going we are back at the Crusades to, is that yes. the SOP has just been elected the leader of the Templar. Yep. So 1191. Now, going back into the Temple of Solomon, where we left off, um, Malik uh, and the, the trio, as I put, the trio of assassins all notice Robert de Saab below, and Malik advises um, Altier to just ignore Robert and go for the artifact, as their master instructed. But um, Altier, believing that he can win extra points by killing their greatest enemy, is um, bound and determined to kill Robert. So, and instead of doing it with stealth, he uh, approaches him, climbs down and approaches him on foot by calling attention to all of them. And um, when Robert asks what he wants, he says blood and then lunges in for the attack. 
but Ribera is too fast and strong and blocks his hidden blade attack and kind of clutches him there for a moment and says, I only spare you so that you can tell your master that the Holy Land is lost to him and his, and if he stays in there, that all of the assassins will die. So then he throws him from the room, breaks part of the scaffolding, which causes like a collapse of debris, blocking Altair off from the room where Malik and Kadar are trapped in with the other Templars. And so, believing them dead, uh, Altair goes to flee the Temple of Solomon, returns to Masyaf to report to Al-Malim. So, Masyaf is our next location. Um, Tiffany has the historical information on the Masyaf, the city of Masyaf. Yeah, I touched on it a little bit in the last episode. So, Masyaf is a city in modern-day northwestern Syria uh, that was never completely defeated by Europe. During the Third Crusade, it is known as the Hashashin Stronghold, which makes perfect sense for it to be your main base in the game. So, the first thing that... Um, once Altier gets into the village, he's uh, he's uh, <laughs> greeted by uh, their trainer named Rauf, and since he is still Master Assassin at this point, um, the uh, the young assassin trainer Rauf is uh, very eager to see uh, Altier and imagines that his mission was a success, and Altier is kind of like trying to downplay it, like, uh, yeah, it's fine. Uh, you know, uh, whereas al Malim, he's like, oh, you know, he's up in his study. And he's like, best go tell him of your success. And he's like, uh, right, uh, I'll do that. And then just continues past him. You go through the village of Masyaf, which is like a series of, uh, well, it looks like a village, but it, it leads an uphill path into the main um, citadel, which I believe is called Alamut, the mountain base. <coughs> It's the giant fortress. So as he gets into the first archway, you see another character there named Abbas. And Abbas pretty much um, accosts him in, his, uh, in a hateful manner and is saying, well, you know, I'm sure your mission was a success. Better go tell Al-Malim so that you can uh, put your tongue to his boot and... Altair delivers a threat that if he keeps talking, he'll put his blade to his throat, and he says, I'll be time for that later, brother. So there's obviously a hostile existing uh, history between these two, and Abbas is brought on for no small conversation. He's going to be uh, an important character coming up later. So... Now we introduce the character Al-Mualim, the, the teacher. Al-Mualim is Arabic for the teacher, and he's based on another historical character. Yes. So Al-Mualim is based off of Rashid Adin Sinan, also known as the Old Man of the Mountain. I believe you can find his name in one of the smaller releases of the game, but not in like the bigger storylines. Okay. But he's known as the Grand Master of the Assassins, uh, his leadership coincides roughly with the rise of Saladin. Um, they began in Iraq and took command in Syria in about 1162, and he was leader until he died in 1193 as well. He is a bitter enemy of Saladin and attempted to assassinate him, or sent people to assassinate him on two different occasions, uh, in 1174 and 1176. Both failed. Uh, he claims credit. He claimed credit for the assassination of Comrade de Montferrat in 1192, who we will also get to later on in the story. Uh, there was a big to do about Montferrat's assassination because the European leaders who actually ended up becoming divided over his assassination and were accusing one another of being responsible for it. Um, so a lot of the Hashashin's uh, lives are shrouded in mystery. Um, so there's a lot of myth about what they actually did or how many people were actually members, like, and everything that's known about them is mostly speculation from outsiders or what other people were able to learn at the time that they were around. Um, but it's guesstimated that his peak members were around 60,000 people. Uh, Amalim was an extremely learned man. He was known to write his own poetry. 
uh, typically, whenever he's represented in any type of historical account, he's presented as a leader of religious extremists. Um, it is reported that he may have tried to make some sort of alliance with the Crusaders to help overthrow Saladin. I do have one quote from him that shows their philosophy around assassination. Be assured that we do not kill any man in this way for the sake of reward or for money, but only when he has first inflicted cause and injury to us. Okay. And there sounds like a basis for the Assassin's Creed, which will be brought up shortly. As Altair um, comes back to um, report to Al-Mualim, he, um, Al-Mualim greets him in a, in a kind of loving manner or an expectant manner to hear good news. And Altair has nothing to give him but news of his failures and of his two missing uh, cohorts or agents. And basically, Al-Mualim just says, excuses, excuses or is actually shocked that he has so many excuses and so little to show for his mission. So um, since Altair brings up that, uh, or no, Altair, no, Almolim actually questions <laughs> him on whether, uh, on the whereabouts of Malik and Kadar and Altair says dead. And much to his surprise, Malik shows up behind him like, no, not dead. Um, and Malik says, I have what you're... Uh, favorite uh failed to retrieve um so he brings in the ark of the covenant um in a small uh chalice shaped um device and a servant uh kind of deposits it on Amalim's desk and then he um goes into detail not too much but he does um he does mention how um Altair's actions cost his brother his life and almost cost them uh, the mission entirely. So Amal and Amalim is about to deal with him when uh, Malik also says, but I didn't just bring the uh, Ark of the Covenant back or the artifact back. He says, I seem to have brought something else back with me. And another guy rushes in and says, we're under attack, we're under siege. So as this is happening, um, the scene cuts to... Um, Altair running from the fortress and um, finding a bunch of Templar men like just outside the fortress um, slaughtering people in the village and so he kills about eight of them as you go back down through the village and then it cuts scene back to where um, Robert and Al-Malim are having it out um, basically um Robert is trying to dictate terms to Al-Mualim, and Al-Mualim is um, declining a surrender, so um, this leads Robert to murder one of his hostages and threaten to starve out all of his people and soldiers, and he asks how loyal uh, will Al-Mualim's men remain once all the food supply is run dry. And Al-Mualim says, uh, my men do not fear death. Um, and he says, uh, he shouts out to a nearby tower and says, show this fool knight what it means to have no fear. And then he says, go to God. And what has happened in the meantime is Altair has been instructed by another assassin to follow him and another assassin up to a high tower. And from the parapets, they uh, have some planks um, protruding out that he then instructs them to leap off of by the word of Al-Molim. And this is where you get your first glimpse of a mechanic in the game called the Leap of Faith, which is a high, high leap from a tall building or structure into a soft spot below, usually a stack of hay. And this is where we say, don't try this at home, kids, because <laughs> this is not physically possible. But um, apparently there were some rumors that um, the real Rashid al-Sanan... Yeah, that's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> there are rumors that he actually did command his followers to jump to their deaths um, to test their loyalty mm -hmm. to him. So this is kind of in character. As we were saying before, the game kind of takes um, rumor and portrays it as... Reality. 
well, not just reality, but portrays it as, like, um, like heinous propaganda against our, and character assassination mm. of the assassins. Yeah. So they portray it as a way of, like, anything that you might have heard is taken extremely out of context because it's all written by the Templars. Mm-hmm. So um, once this is achieved, um, the funny thing is one of the guys doesn't pull off the illusion completely. As soon as they land in the hay bales, the guy's like, ah, my leg. And then the other guy's like, quiet, fool. Do you want them to hear us? They'll shatter the illusion. So um, <laughs> he just kind of stifles his cries. And he's like, you go ahead, Altair. Go uh, rain death on our enemies. So Altair follows this mountain path uh, behind uh, Roberto de Saab's troops where there's a giant log tower waiting to dispense um, a ton of lumber on them. And this actually works, and it knocks out half of um, Roberto's uh, army, or his uh, force that he brought with him. Probably not his entire army, but his attack force. And so Roberto's forced to retreat from Masyaf. And then the very next thing to do for um, Ongbalim is to discipline his pupil, um, Altier, for breaking all three tenets of the creed. Uh, first, he questions if he knows why he was successful in the mission, and he says because he listened, you know, were that he listened in uh, Jerusalem, they would have uh, not had this problem happen. So he said that every life that happened, that they lost today, was lost because of him, because A, uh, well, first he broke the creed by slaughtering the man, which Malik, of course, told him. Then Malik tells him about his um, exposure to Robert and his troops, which actually broke two other tenants. So the first tenant that he broke by slaying the man was uh, the first tenant of the creed, stay your blade from the flesh of the innocent. Assassins don't kill wantonly, as we heard in um, the, as we heard, damn phone. Sorry. As we heard in the, um, in the account of uh, al-Rashid's quote, it sounds very in character with the assassins. The uh, second one is... Um, hide in plain sight, which he refused to do when he jumped out in front of Robert and his men. And then the next one was quite immediate as he tried to attack Robert. He compromised the Brotherhood by uh, losing that battle and uh, thereby uh, provoking the Templars into a battle, which they were already going to fight anyways, but this is another way hey, he can break the creed. So he did all of these things. He must be punished, and Al-Malim basically uh, fires him by stabbing him in the gut with a, <laughs> with a, yeah, with a crooked blade. And then so the scene goes black, and um, at this point we flash back to the modern day uh, into the lab. Lucy wants to pull him out of the uh, wants to pull Desmond out of the simulation. I don't know if I introduced the character. I might not have mentioned her name. Dr. Lucy Stillman is uh, Dr. Warren Vidic's accomplice, and she's like the good cop to his bad cop. Um, anytime he wants to push Desmond harder, um, she argues that uh, he needs a rest. Uh, because of something that's very dangerous, because of a very dangerous side effect that the Animus has. With their previous test subjects, they discovered something called the bleeding effect, which is also the name of our show. Yay. And we mentioned it in passing in the first episode, but um, it's really where their test subjects start to blend the genetic memory with reality outside of the Animus, and it's led to them losing their mind completely and even cause suicide in some patients. So um, she's being very careful with Desmond so that this doesn't happen. And as we found out when we started the game, the Animus addresses him as test subject 17. So there were 16 others before him that presumably died since they got to him. So we'll come to those later. But um, Lucy demands that... um, he takes a break and uh, Warren says, what's another two hours? And then um, instead of arguing with him openly, um, continuously, she calls him into the conference room. And uh, there, so this is a gameplay mechanic. If you can, you can go into the room that Desmond has and into the bathroom stall. 
there's like a vent where he can listen into the conference room on what's going on. And basically, um, Vidic's telling, uh, talking to her about like, you know, just listening to what he says and not being insubordinate. And she's saying that he's being stupid because he's going to lose them another test subject who has valuable information they need. So then, um, he mentions the deadline and that's, uh, pressed on him by Abstergo. And... Is so there she then agrees. Special about this deadline, like, do they have to get what they're seeking before a certain time because something's going to happen, or just because? Yes. Okay. There is something that's going to happen, and that's going to be elaborated on in a later game. Okay. Um, but they do mention the deadline for now. It's just their concern, but we'll find out what it is later. And as we are halfway through this episode already, wow! <laughs> With our time, I'm trying to speed this along. Um, basically. Uh, Vidic allows Desmond to take a nap. Once he wakes up, um, he's, he's uh, forced to go back into the Animus. And as he's walking toward the Animus, they have these small chats together, uh, him and Vidic, where basically he just questions um, what Vidic's doing. Um, I, I think this conversation was initiated by him asking who he gets to kill today. And he says, you know, you shouldn't be so... Um, ready to kill. He says, your ancestors had the right idea about, like, you know, um, the deaths of a few being good for the many and everything. And he's saying that, um, basically, that uh, corruption's like a cancer and it needs to be, it needs to be excised from, like, the whole populace before it spreads. So that's why, like, the killing of a few individuals, he does agree with this principle. Um, that uh, Desmond's ancestors held. And he feels that... Um, and uh, Desmond makes a joke, chemo for the masses, which is what I call this speech, chemo for the masses. That's basically what he's trying to administer to the populace. And um, <clears throat> So he's slowly, little by little, he's elaborating on the, the cause behind the company of Sturgo and what their true goals what their true goals mean. This is going to lead to like a big, elaborate, um, kind of like a better world kind of strategy thing going on here. I don't know how what else to call it right now, but we'll get more of that later. We just have a better idea of what Abstergo stands for now. So he returns into the Animus and um, to find that there is more storyline to play out from Altair. Um, he did not, in fact, get killed by his master, but he was deceived into an illusion to think that he was. And this is his, um, this is his way of punishing Altair. And another way of punishing him is his instantaneous demotion from Master Assassin back to Novice. Um, I don't have time today to go into the Assassin rankings, but there are at least... 25 ranks or 15 or 16 ranks I believe I think I messed up the number should be 16 ranks right now in this Brotherhood of Assassins so he's reduced back down to number zero basically and he has to learn how to be an assassin this is their um, way of tutoring the player and what an assassin does so he has to basically track his targets down using the mechanics of eavesdropping and pickpocketing and interrogation. And then later on, when he gets into the cities, he'll also have, like, other assassin informants that he's able to um, help out. If you help out other assassins in the cities, they'll give you information on your targets. So right now, the task at hand is to find the inside man, because apparently it came to Al Malim's attention that there was a man on the inside, who aided Roberta Thob, and as Altair uh, f tracks down this target, uh, come to find out this guy is actually um, swapped sides. He's a complete traitor, and he swapped sides to ally with the Templars because he believes that um, Al Mualim is not as great as he says he is. He thinks that he's insane and that he's going to lead them all to their downfall. So. In his mind, what he did was completely right, and um, since um, 
Altair is commanded not to kill him on sight, but just to interrogate him. He brings him back to Al-Mualim, who demands that he repents. And when he doesn't, Al-Mualim just stabs him. So He's very stabby. He's very stabby. <laughs> but this time for real. So now Altair thinks that he's won back his lost honor. And he says, oh, no, we're just getting started. Um, I have nine targets for you to kill. And um, you won't get all of your ranking back until you've accomplished this task. And he says, okay, so tell me who they are. And he's like, okay, I've told you all that I'm going to tell you. So you have to go find your targets. And he's like, all right, if you think so. And he's like, also, you need to go to these three cities that your targets are in, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Acre, all three uh, key points in the uh, War of the Crusades, in the Third Crusade, Mm -hmm. I believe. Yes. So he's um, also told him that he has to report to the Rafiq as he can't start his mission. He has to report to each Rafiq, and a Rafiq is a um, is a bureau owner in each of the cities. So Altair cannot start his missions without con- consulting with them first, and to which he is outraged that the master is making him go through this much. And he says, it's basically the price you pay for your own arrogance. So that's all you... Like, you got a whole bunch of people killed, so... Yeah. (laughs) So it's the least I can expect of you, pretty much. So you can definitely tell that he's still his favorite, because otherwise, why would he still be around after all this failure? So he goes on these missions now. Um, Well, he sends him forth with, with on these missions... You leave through the kingdom, and once you get to the gates of... Or you leave through this village, and once you get through the gates of the village, you go through the area called the kingdom, which is like a massive open world map. And at the bottom, there's three roads um, on to the, to the south, east, and west. And I believe that Damascus is on the eastern side of the map, according to this game. So... Once you go through that road, you enter the city of Damascus. Um, Your only entryway into the city at this point, because it's blocked off by Saracen guards, is to um, rescue... Like, off in the corner, there is a scholar being bullied by other Saracen guards, and you basically take them all down with your longsword. I forgot to mention, at this point, the only weapons that you have are your long sword and your hidden blade. So if you take all of them down, the scholar shows his gratitude by um, calling four other scholars in, or three other scholars in, and allowing you to blend in with the group. And since Saladin uh, is famous for proclaiming scholars' access into every point in the city, you can sneak in past the guards because your garb... Your assassin's hooded garb looks like the white robes of a scholar, so they don't notice you coming into the city. You mean Amelie? Hmm? You mean Amelie? Amelie? What about him? You said Saladin. Oh. No, Saladin, yeah. Oh. Saladin did allow him to, did allow scholars to go through the oh, city. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So, um, now that we're in Damascus, um, this is your first location you're going to, as I mentioned. And um, the other rescue missions that you have, just a brief side note, are um, citizens. There are these women who are being bullied by um, the city guard as well. And if you kill off those city guard members and uh, rescue her, she will call her brothers to um, aid you if you are being chased. What they do is they detain the soldiers. So the soldiers are running around chasing you. And if they see them, they'll run up to them and grab them by their garments, basically, and just try to tackle them down so they can't follow you. So it's a very um, strategic escape maneuver. And these are just like little, um, they're side missions. They're sprinkled all throughout the map. You can do these if you wish. It will help you uh, travel through the city pretty much uninhibited or less inhibited than you would normally be. Okay, I need to get on to the first target. (laughs) So um, the first stop that you should do is the Damascus Bureau, and in there is the Rafiq. Um, He doesn't really have a name, or his name is Rafiq. It's uncertain which. Mm. But um, he basically, in 
Each Rafiq is um, deposited in a city with a trade as a cover for their assassination guild. So the trade of this Rafiq in Damascus is Silk Merchant, and it's very, very much fitting of his character because he speaks to Altair in sly tones, which kind of denote his uh, disgust for his behavior, but he says it in a way that to come off like he still respects him as his superior and everything. And he's very much uh, like a backhanded complimenter. I don't know what you call somebody like that. Mm. I guess he's a very two-faced person, you would say. So um, Altier, you know, doesn't like him at all. Why should he? Um, but he has to report to him. Once Once you do all of your eavesdrop, interrogate, pickpock, mis- pickpocket missions, you um, gain intel on your target but before that um he goes to the Rafiq to find out who his target is and the Rafiq gives him the name Tamir and um tells him where he might find the information as you go throughout the city um the viewpoints reveal icons which show the different types of uh missions the different types of info collecting missions that you can get and if you do enough of those, you have to do at least three in order to report back to the Rafiq and tell him that you've gained intel on the um, on the target. So the first target's name is Tamir, and he is a weapons dealer, and his uh, home base is in the Souk al Salah, and um, he's basically going to be he's going to be occupied doing a weapons transaction, and that's where Altier plans to strike. So he tells this to the Rafiq, who then gives him a feather marker, which will be used to um, wipe in the blood of the target once the assassination is complete. And then that will be given to Al-Malim, who will know that his task has been done. Uh, how he knows it's that guy's blood, don't ask me, but that's what the mission is. So that's how they kept track of their targets before blood testing was available, <laughs> before DNA testing was available. So... Um, now, Altier goes into the mission. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about the first target. So his pre-assassination, um, you see him in the Souk al-Salah. You see Tamir right now in the Souk al-Salah. He's arguing with the merchant about a, uh, shipment or a, a, um, an order that was not filled for his client. And now he has to explain to his client why... Uh, he doesn't have this, and he's accusing the merchant, or he's, I think he's accusing the supplier of being lazy and incompetent. So the supplier kind of retorts with him, saying that he's uh, just far too demanding of people who are, like, overworked and underpaid. So in response to this, uh, Tamir becomes enraged and stabs him publicly in the fountain of the Souk al-Salah and just lets him bleed out there. And all the onlookers who are watching do nothing to help. They are all shocked and out of fear. They kind of um, do not speak about it and they continue on with their business. So as Tamir inspects the goods, that's when you can, as the playable character, Altier, go up and assassinate Tamir. You want to do it as quietly and stealthily as possible, of course, but the most stealth you can get is just um, being covered by other onlookers. So as he lays him down after his assassination, um, he basically tells him that his evil deeds are at an end and he's not going to profit anymore from the suffering of others. Um... And that's where Tamir elaborates to him because there's these there's these mechanics in the game called the deathbed confessional. These are the end. These are the assassination cutscenes. Um, I don't believe it's called that. I just call it that. But um, on his deathbed confessional, he confesses um, what he knows of his cause to Altair for like a brief period of time. It kind of takes you off screen and puts you where um, you can see his. Uh, where they're, like, isolated in kind of a animus vacuum for a while, where you're not being noticed or pursued by any guards. 
So he confesses to him that um, he isn't acting alone, that he serves a far nobler cause, and that soon um, all of uh, the assassins, he says, uh, him and his kind will pay for with their lives, and um, his brothers will come after him. And uh, he said, but I thought, you know, I thought you worked for... Um, He's like, you mean the the Saracens, like Saladin? And he's like, no, I don't work for Saladin. Um, like he thought he did, because apparently this guy was a supplier to Saladin, but he betrayed him to serve a different cause. And Altair is not sure who he serves yet, but this will become apparent later on. And the debriefing that he has with um, Al Malim about this, he says that um, he asks he questions him about, like, how he knows Al-Malim, and, uh, and he questions him about, um, why he seems to, um, think that he doesn't act alone, why the guy said that he doesn't act alone, and why his, why his deeds were for, like, a better cause and everything, and, um, Al-Malim's saying basically, like, well, any act, if you look at it, if you look at it within the context of, like, a bunch of acts is going to, make rational sense so that's all that's all there is to it and basically says you know I, you know i thought you learned about asking too much questions and if i withhold info it's because you're not ready to know these things and <laughs> gives him this blanket talk but basically uses an excuse his failure to um comply with demands and follow orders led to his downfall in the first place so he kind of uses his shame against him and deters him from inquiring further. Now we're on to the second city. So after after this target, he gets his uh, short blade back, and you're able to do more combat moves. We move on to Jerusalem, which is the second location, and um, you have to visit the Bureau Rafiq there, who actually turns out to be none other than Malik himself, the guy from the first mission that Altair went on in Solomon's Temple. And Malik is none too pleased to see him, but he's been aware that he's approaching. And you'll notice that Malik's arm is gone because in the attack from uh, Robert in the temple, he got his arm injured and he had to have it amputated. So he has this to hold against him as well. Um, so next he... Uh, Oh, and his trade, as far as, like, what their cover trade is in the city of Jerusalem, uh, Malix is a cartographer, he's a map maker, and that keeps him from being identified as an assassin by the city officials. So, um, he gives him his second target, who is Talal, and, um, as, as Altier finds out from his missions, Talal is a slaver, um, he's been picking up, like, uh, vagrants off the streets, basically homeless people and uh, the ill from, like, hospital beds and everything, um, and uh, prostitutes from the brothels and putting them into slavery, um, or what the rumors say, and he's based in a warehouse in the Barbican, which is a kind of fortress. Um, within the city of Jerusalem, you have to kind of sneak your way past the guards to get into there. It's no easy feat, but once you're in there, um, you find the Barbican and warehouse, and you go inside, and the door shuts behind you, and then it starts you on a pathway, um, among a bunch of, like, crowded, um, cages of various kinds and shapes where a bunch of slaves are being held as Talal speaks to Altair, um, and it tries to make an argument for his cause, saying that he's doing what's best for these people, um, taking them from their miserable lives to live better ones, and he's saying, no, slavery is not a better life, dude, like, what are you talking about? And then, so, he demands to see him, so he lets him into a room where he's surrounded by his guards, and he says, okay, what did you want to see me about? And he says, well, you should come down and fight me so that you can settle this with honor, and the guy's like, well, you know, I'm not one for violence, so I'll just leave you to my men. And he sticks his men on him, and Altair manages to kill all nine of the bodyguards. And then uh, the 
Your target, Talal, he takes off running across the rooftops and uh, then into the streets where Altair has, is forced to chase him. And once he finally does catch him, he assassinates him, um, asks about his, um, about his role, what his confessions are and everything. And uh, he basically says that... Um, he basically says that uh, Altair's master is not the only uh, only one with designs upon the Holy Land, and that they have like plans for this place. And he was planning to take the slaves um, into a better life, um, and he was taking in. His justification was that he was taking in people who nobody else would help, and he was going to like cure their ills or. Uh, make better their situations, lead them on to a better life, and which Altair totally doesn't believe, but he still questions, when he's debriefed by um, Al-Malim, he questions him about this too, and he says that, um, how do you know that somebody's mad? How do you know that somebody's insane? And he's like, I don't know, because they talk funny. And he's like, no, because they try to, they talk about the irrational like it's rational. So that he's like, that should tell you already that the guy is insane, and um, he says, but lots of people, um, lots of um, corrupt leaders try to share in their madness and influence their followers with it, and he's saying this is why we have the tenant in our, in our slogan um, saying that nothing is true, so that, you can, so that you can identify the truth from the lies, and after this debriefing, um, Altier obtains his throwing knives, um, your third location is Acre, and in Acre, um, you encounter the Bureau Rafiq named Jabal, who is a scribe, and Jabal is by far the nicest one to Altair, but he still is let down by Altair's failings, so um, he asks Altair to prove himself um, by completing the mission, which is to go assassinate Garnier de Naplus, and um, Tiffany has more information on Garnier de, de Naplus. Yes. So, <laughs> Garnier de Naplus, uh, I mentioned earlier in relation to Robert de Salve, is he was the 10th Grand Master of the Knights Hospitalier from 1190 to 1192. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm sorry, in the previous episode, the Knights Hospitalier, there are the religious order that's similar to the Templars, uh, that were known for creating medical houses for the sick and injured and became a military order during the First Crusade. Uh, Denabalus, unlike in the game's portrayal of him, isn't really known for being cruel. He's actually known for being quite brave and a great leader. He's uh, best known for disobeying King Richard, actually, uh, which led to a decisive victory in the Battle of Arsuf in 1191. And that's Nablus? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So... In this game, um, the the information, the intel that um, Altair gains on him uh, elaborates that he is actually, um, he's taking in the mentally unwell instead of the physically unwell, and he's blocking off people from entering the hospital. And uh, he so he's caring for these patients with mental illnesses, and apparently he's doing these uh, cruel experiments on them. So he's kind of like a, what would you call it, a mangala? Like yeah. the, the famous, uh, as much as I hate this word. Nazi. The famous, yeah, Nazi scientist who did experiments on um, his charges. Yeah. So um, that's apparently what Garnier's doing. Um, he's housed in the uh, Hospitalier Fortress in Acre. And once... Uh, the Rafiq gives the feather to Altair. He then goes in and to the hospital. I believe you have to enter from the rooftops and you have to take out the archers there so that you will not be killed on sight. And once the archers are gone, um, you go down into the courtyard where it starts a cutscene of a patient running wildly around trying to escape and the guards block off his exit and start to beat him. And then as Garnier de Naplus appears in his hospitalier robes, I think he mentioned the black 
uniform with the white cross. Oh, yes. I, I think I mentioned it in the previous episode. But, yeah, the Knights Hospitalier, the, even their dress is different from the Templars. They're the black robes with the white cross. So um, he basically uh, tells the, the inmate to calm down and that um, he, uh, you know, he wishes to help him and everything. And he says uh, the guy uh, counters with uh, saying that, no, he didn't help the others. He took their souls and he's not going to get his. And then Garnier strikes him across the face and tells him to take hold of his senses. And he says it gives no pleasure to him to hurt the man, but he leaves him no choice because, you know... Um, <clears throat> and the guy basically turns to the crowd and says every every kindness that he does for us is like met with the back of his hand and he's like he's just full of lies and he's uh you know he only seeks to harm us and everything and uh Garnier says he shouldn't have done that and he uh tells his guards to take him back to his cell and the guy says that um he can take him back in but he'll just escape again Garnier decides to tell his guards to break his legs so that he will not be able to escape and this happens this is a pretty graphic scene where they just basically stomp on his kneecaps and uh they crush his legs and drag him off to his bed again so he's like screaming the whole way they hobble him yeah basically and um so from there um if you find in the crowd of people who are on looking at the scene a group of scholars, um, you follow them inside the hospital because they're the only ones that have admittance in past that point. Um, you can then walk freely through the hospital and you find Garnier tending to his patients, some of whom are grateful to him. And that's how you can sneak up behind him and assassinate him while he's distracted. So after his assassination, um, Altier questions him uh about his experiments, and he says, like, you know, what's going to happen to the people that I was taking care of? And he's like, um, you weren't taking care of them, dude. You were torturing them. And he's saying, no, I was, you know, trying to take the people who were madmen, who are insane already, and make them live better lives. He's like, that's, you know, what the, that's what my experiments were for. And he says, the artifact that you and your master deprived us of, um kept my research from continuing and he says but there are there are other herbs and mixtures and extracts which can yield some of the same results but I'll need but we will need the artifact back um, to continue the research he says but now I can't do it because I'm dead so there's no help for these people now and he dies with that word and uh, you get the feather marker and then you take it on to debrief with Al Malim again, um, but before you do, you have a third break um, from the Animus. You go back into the modern time, and Desmond's let out to take a break and a brief nap, or I think he takes an overnight nap. But this is basically um, again uh, Miss Stillman's mandate, so that he won't have to suffer the prolonged terms of bleeding effect. And as he wakes up, um, he has another talk with Vidic, and uh, basically um, Vidic is uh, happy about uh, uh, Lucy fixing the animus so that he's able to stay longer inside there. And uh, when Desmond questions Vidic about the treasure hunt they're on, uh, he basically uh, says that he basically elaborates on the work that Abstergo does, and he says that they try to maintain order in the world through their company. Um, and he says that every scientific uh, breakthrough within the past century, because Abstergo was established in the 1930s, 1934 to be exact, he says every breakthrough has led to, um, has been, um, is has been made by Abstergo Industries. And he says, of course, they don't take credit for it, but um, he says Abstergo Industries are their predecessors. Of course, they don't take credit for it, but this is how they're able to kind of, like, um, administer their form of order to the populace. And that, and 
Desmond said that's a pretty bold claim. Like, how is it that you guys are, like, so genius and us mere mortals are kind of stumbling around in the dark, not discovering anything? And he says, well, to be fair, we don't discover them. We find them. He says they're gifts left to us by, um, by a previous civilization. I don't know if he says civilization, but he says those who came before. So he alludes to the previous civilization. We're at our hour marker, but I'm almost finished. Okay. So um, this is a, another hallmark of the Assassin's Creed series, that these artifacts come from a pre-existing civilization, and more will be brought up on that later. Um, as our last note, um, he basically questions him about um, the doctor saying that he, uh, he had cause to... Um, to, he believed that he was actually taking care of the people and not harming them and everything, and he doesn't understand. Um, so he kind of like has a crisis of faith on his missions and everything. Wonders if he's like doing the right thing, and um, William notices and is kind of inappreciative of his uh, attitudes changing towards it and everything. And uh, but he says that uh, he said that some of the patients seemed grateful towards him, and he's like, "Well, yes." Uh, he apparently brainwashed them with his, uh, with his uh, herb, with his herbal concoctions, and he's saying that um, he's seen firsthand some things that um, herbal concoctions and drugs uh, and remedies can do to a man to like render him senseless. And he says that some of their enemies have accused him of doing the same. And this is something we wanted to bring up, like how the assassins got their name. Yeah, it's definitely a big allusion to the Hash Hashins and the origin of their name. So again, like we mentioned before, the Hash Hashins did not choose that name. It was given to them by others um, because it's believed that they were mostly known for smoking a lot of hashish and then doing their weird, as reported by others, ritualistic practices and stuff. And that's how the leaders of the assassins were able to control their followers because they'd be so high all the time that they would, you know, follow orders blindly, not really paying attention. Oh, yeah. So I Googled something last night just to figure out, just to make sure we were, like, on the same point. Um, so we were, like, asking if uh, hashish, like, it sounds like it's just hash, like weed, like pot. It comes from actually the same plant, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> and it's actually not the the leaves itself but they take it from like a resin from the plant and apparently it induces like a stronger um narcotic effect so it's a heavier drug and this is why it has like these uh more euphoric powers over the subject now um so after this this is kind of the conclusion of our episode okay so at this point um, after the debriefing, um, Al-Molim tells Altair that, uh, Richard and Richard has gone to, um, to the Battle of Arsuf, basically to, to the Battle of Arsuf. He's taken his army to conquer, he's trying to conquer Jerusalem again because of their last defeat, and Saladin has taken, uh, soldiers down to Arsuf to, like, block them off from getting to Jerusalem. And this will lead to the Battle of Arsuf, which will happen later on in the game. But in our next episode, we're going to have three more targets who are all the regents of the three cities that are left in place of Saladin and Richard. They're basically... Their, their task is to govern the people in their stead. So, um, and... Uh, who is it? Al-Mualim warns Altair about men who pretend to govern and everything. And so those, he justifies like the reason why those three are his next targets. Um, and if, now we can go into our contact information if you want. Um, I don't know the contact I was okay. going to say the recap. Well, okay. So we're going to go ahead and give you guys our info. Uh, you can contact us at bleedingfxcast at twitter.com. And our email 
is our Gmail account. Um, it's just bleeding effxcast at gmail.com. If you guys want to email us like longer questions and the tweets and everything, uh, we're working on getting more platforms for the podcast. Uh, I think we're talking about getting a Stitcher and a Google Play account. Um, so hopefully we can expand our platforms. Also, there's a Facebook page dedicated to the bleeding effect if anybody wants to post there. Um, but other than that, that's it, guys. We'll see you guys next Wednesday. Um, so if your eagle vision's on the fritz again. It's fine. Healthy even. Just relax. You're just experiencing the, the bleeding, bleeding effect. effect.